Welcome. Now this video introduces partial and semi-partial correlation. So these techniques are closely related to simple correlation, um, also to regression and, and multiple regression. Uh, if you're not familiar with those, you might want to revisit the, the previous videos on those topics before we, we move ahead. I'll also recap the difference between correlation and regression. Although they're, they're related techniques, the math is, is very similar behind the scenes in many cases, and you can get one from the other. Um, there are, I suppose, philosophical goals or differences in the goals of these, these two methods. So strictly speaking, correlation is to test for association between two variables without any assumption of, of causality. In fact, the variables are often interdependent, um, controlled by some process maybe that we can't measure. Regression is, is technically used when you think that one variable is actually causing changes in the other, or you want to predict one variable from measurements of, of the other. In reality, you often see people using these methods interchangeably, um, and, and you'll see from, from this video, partial correlation does kind of blur the lines between strict association and strict causality because of something which you'll learn called the confounding variables. But partial correlation is often quite useful because natural systems can have a lot of interacting or interdependent processes. So as, as an example, the abundance of clouds over the ocean often is correlated with the amount of these tiny particles called aerosols. When there's a lot of aerosols, there's also a lot of clouds, and vice versa. But both aerosols and clouds can be correlated with wind speed. So maybe wind speed could be something called a mediating or a confounding variable. Perhaps some or all of the correlation between aerosols and clouds occurs because both of those two things are actually correlated with the third factor of wind speed. So what we'd really want to know is say what was the strength of correlation between aerosols and clouds after or for accounting for the fact that, that wind speed might affect both of them. So to perform partial correlation, you need two continuous main variables, the one that you're interested the ones you're interested in, and at least one potentially confounding variable. Um, the confounding variable is usually also continuous, but I've seen examples where it's categorical, although these seem to be less common. And I described in the, in the previous slide, the purpose of partial correlation is to test for an association between the two main variables after accounting for or controlling for the effects of a confounding variable or variables. You can do more than one, although it gets complicated. The null hypothesis is that there's no relationship or association between the two main variables after controlling for the confounding variable. So I won't go into too much detail about the mathematics behind this, but basically the, co the correlation coefficient, the partial correlation coefficient between our two variables is the simple correlation coefficient, which is this R A B, the correlation between A and B, adjusted to account for the correlations between each main variable and the confounding variable C. So the correlation between A and C, or R, A, C, and the correlation between B and C. So this is Pearson's partial correlation coefficient, and it has a single confounding variable, and so the equation um, looks like this. Um, for hypothesis testing, the coefficient that you get can be converted into a, something that follows a t-distribution where the degrees of freedom are n, the number of total observations you have, minus 2, minus k, which is the number of confounding variables, so generally n minus 3. Well, in this case, it would be. So another way to think about partial correlations is with sort of a graphical Venn diagram example. So imagine this circle shows the range of values of variable b. Well, if we add air variable A, there might be some overlap because some there's some correlation between the two. Some of the variability in B will correlate with or be accounted for by variable A. Right? That's part of the reason we say correlation or regression is that some of variable B is explained by, by variable A. So that's the greenish sort of central overlapping region of these two circles. But in partial correlation, we add a third confounding variable, the red one here, which you can see overlaps with, with all three. And what this does is it reduces the area of this central green area, which is now the variance in B that's accounted for by A after we remove the effects of C. So we basically removed the red wedge, and we're left just with the upper um, greenish wedge that is essentially the, the variance in B accounted for A after you remove C. So in this case, the partial correlation coefficient is smaller than the simple correlation coefficient, 
Um, but that isn't always the case. It can actually increase after considering a confounding variable, in which case the confounding variable is said to suppress the interaction. So another way to think about partial correlation is thinking about it in the context of regression. So actually the partial correlation coefficient is really just the same as the simple correlation between the residuals of our variables. So essentially what we have, let's say we take the residuals in a regression of aerosol amount versus wind speed. Remember residuals are the difference between our best fit line, sort of the expected value, and the observed value. So I've highlighted one vertical red line there. So the residuals basically tell us what is left over in the aerosol value after accounting for the effects of wind speed. Basically, what aerosols are versus what they should be given wind speed. We can do the same thing for cloud abundance. We can get the residuals for all those, and then we can plot in the large graph on the right the residuals of cloud abundance after accounting for wind speed, and the residuals of aerosols after accounting for wind speed, and then calculate the correlation between those two. So as partial correlation is a relationship between the two variables after accounting for the effect of the confounding variables, that's actually the same thing as the simple correlation between the residuals here. If you do this, you'll find that the p-value for a correlation between the residuals is not the same as the p-value for partial correlation, and that's because in this case we're not dealing with degrees of freedom correctly. You'd have to um, subtract an extra degree of freedom that doesn't get accounted for here. But sort of conceptually speaking, the correlation coefficient that you get, this number between 0 and 1, is the same if you run the partial correlation formula from the previous slide, or if you calculate the cor correlation between the residuals. So the partial correlation is the more commonly used of the two methods. There's also something called semi-partial correlation, and it is quite similar. Um, the, basically, the only difference is that the confounding variable is only thought to influence one of the two main variables, and not both of them, as in the previous case. So perhaps wind speed affects aerosol amount, but not cloud abundance. So in that case, we could run a semi-partial correlation to assess the correlation between aerosols and clouds while accounting for the confounding effect of wind speeds on aerosol abundance only. In other words, this is basically testing how much aerosols add to cloud abundance, how much aerosols add to our knowledge of cloud abundance, essentially, above and beyond what we'd expect from the effect of wind speeds on aerosols. Do they add anything useful? That's what the semi-partial correlation is basically telling us. So the assumptions for partial correlation and semi-partial correlation are the same as those for simple correlation. Most often you see this in terms of Pearson's partial correlation coefficient. So just like in simple correlation, it assumes a linear relationship, which really means it's not a curved relationship. There's not no serious outlier points. The observations should be independent of each other, which largely means you should have, make sure you're avoiding time series data. Um, potentially data with spatial structure as well. It could be spatial correlation between the points. Each pair of variables should be something called bivariate normal, which is like a two-dimensional normal distribution. So instead of a bell curve, you have sort of like a bell-shaped mountain, like a Hershey's Kiss. Um, but in reality, you just typically assess whether each variable is approximately normal on its own. So those assumptions are for the parametric version, but just like for simple correlation, you can do non-parametric partial correlation using the Spearman coefficient or the Kendall coefficient. And this is what you would do in the case that you might have a nonlinear relationship or non-normal, non-parametric variables. So to report the results, you should describe the relationship you're assessing, including the confounding variables. Uh, for semi-partial correlation, you should explain which one of the main variables you think is being influenced by the confounding ones. Now, if you're writing a research paper, this might require a few sentences or some explanation, um, you know, to provide the background and, and the justification. Uh, you know, beyond that, you should, of course, report the partial or semi-partial correlation coefficient. Make sure you say which one you used and um, whether it's the Pearson, the R, Spearman's Row, Kendall's Tau. The correlation coefficient itself is very important because it tells you about the strength of the actual relationship. Of course, you actually report the p-value too. That is sort of the 
the statistical significance, which is goes kind of in tandem with the, the strength of the actual relationship. And finally, um, you might include scatter plots to visualize the results. Um, it's complicated here, just like it is in multiple regression, um, because just plotting the two main variables against each other doesn't take into account the confounding variables and how those might change the relationship once they're accounted for. Um, one way to get around that is to take advantage of the similarity between correlation and regression and do the, make that plot of residuals against residuals that shows the effect once you've removed it, but it's a little complicated to explain. So, um, you know, there's often not a plot that is really good for this. And if you have more than one confounding variable, it'll be really hard to graph and also to, to describe and interpret. So here's an example of, of how you might phrase this. You know, no significant correlation between aerosols and cloud abundance. After controlling for wind speed, that's our confounding variable. We do a Pearson partial correlation, we get some R value and a, and a P value, for example. The formulas for partial and semi-partial correlation aren't that complicated to make yourself, um, but there's already a package that does both, so might as well take advantage of that. Um, so in the, the, the package ppcore, there's a function called pcore.test for partial correlation. It simply requires each of the main variables, which I call v1 and v2 here, um, as vectors, because they should be a single numeric vector each, um, and the confounding variable um, as a vector, if there's one of them, or as a data frame, if there's more than one. You can choose um, Spearman or Kendall if you need to do a non-parametric partial correlation, just using the method equals, and it can be abbreviated method equals s or k if you, if you want. Um, and finally, um, the function spcore.test is for semi-partial semi correlation, um, and it works the same way, the same format, the three variables. Uh, you can use method equals Spearman if you want, um, but in this case note that the, the confounding variable only influences the second of the two main variables, so you're basically looking at how variable one is called variable two, accounting for the effect of the confounding variable on variable two.